Well, I'm hearing all sorts of influence uh, on Stash Weisslaus with that cut. Yeah, I just love the um, the total abandon. You could just tell he's getting right up to the microphone. He's playing with the rhythm. He's not really strapped into the string band grid necessarily. It's kind of like you get this serious freedom that he's experimenting while he's still kind of delivering a certain attack that the guitar wants. And I just love it. It's also comedy lyrics. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's just the classic <laughs> Roger Miller silliness. But also, uh, I mean, a rock energy to some of that rhythm. Totally. Yeah. And that's the guitar that Tony Rice got? Is that what you told me? Yeah, I don't know, uh, Stash, if you know this history or not. I don't uh, know. I don't know about the, uh, if that's the one, but... The Holy Grail guitar thing, huh? Well, yeah, uh, who knows on this recording, but yeah. Um, and Stash, fill in if you know more than I do about this, but Clarence White had a, a big old Martin guitar with an expanded sound hole, right? It was a little bit larger than typical. Either someone expanded it at some point, I guess, to try to get some more volume out of it. And and after he died, the the family, I think it was Tony Rice, purchased the guitar from the family and had it, you know, fixed up and restored and things. Um, and so, yeah, when flat pickers are talking about the great guitars and and Stash, what we talked earlier, kind of about about how part of the genre is so tied into the instruments in a in a very deep way. You know, the pre-war. World War II, Martin guitars are the most sought after instruments that just no other guitars have that sound. And uh, they can easily go for six figures now when they're, uh, when a good one comes up. Anyway, I think it's just an important part of the, the genre of, of this is, is that carefully cultivated instruments, either where they're trying to go for a sound that connects to some of those traditional things. And, um, Anyway, so yeah, so there's a there's a lot of talk about uh, Clarence White's uh, you know amazing guitar and how it was one of the loudest and most beautiful of all guitars. Um, but putting that aside and just talking about Clarence White, uh, you know the we're talking about this kind of rock and roll energy, and yes, it's a raucous song about drinking and and things. Um, but like you said, there's an interesting thing there and in kind of a solo where he's almost he's like playing off the beat and floating over the beat and then coming back in. Something that you didn't really hear bluegrass guitarists do much before that. Yeah, it's so great. Yeah, and so he's kind of that that connection to um, you know, the the sixties, you know, and and the developing sound and his influence uh, you know, he's the next guy after Doc Watson that's just had huge impact on all guitarists that come after him. Um, and because he he was such a virtuoso uh, on the electric guitar and just his his natural musicality kind of in whatever setting he was in. Um, he was also a part of the famous Mule Skinner band um, that we've mentioned before, which was David Grisman. Uh, Peter Rowan on vocals and rhythm guitar, Bill Keith, uh, a real seminal, important banjo player after Earl Scruggs, and Richard Green, um, a very, uh, you know, modern, uh, adventuresome uh, fiddler. And Bill Monroe is coming to Southern California uh, to do a performance uh, for a TV show, for a local Southern California TV show, and the bus broke down. And I think Grisman had probably had a hand in kind of organizing this. So he stepped in and he said, hey, I'll put together a band. Or they asked him, can you get together a band to play for the show? And that's another one of these, you know, huge moments when the hippie kids kind of came in and performed. And Clarence White, that's that record is where a lot of, uh, you know, uh, kids and young people first heard Clarence White was with that Mule Skinner group, that Mule Skinner album which was getting passed around uh, along with, uh, you know, Old and in the Way, which came a little later with Jerry Garcia, or maybe around the same time. I can't, I'm not sure. But that that's where I first heard Clarence White. And on that album, he plays electric guitar on a few cuts, and, you know, it's just killing. And he's just, he's a dominant voice on that, on that album without, you know, 
being flashy, just playing incredible stuff. The, the fast uh, fiddle tunes, spacey kind of rock interpretations of bluegrass songs. And it was a real, real amazing uh, album. Um, so yeah, his, his influence can't be, uh, overstated. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking at my notes and he was, he was killed at age 29. Now we're kind of getting into, you know, the sixties and, and early seventies. And another, uh, cut that Stash suggested was, uh, from, a bluegrass, uh, singer, right? He's a singer too. And guitarist Larry Sparks. Yeah. People mostly associate him with the singing, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and one thing is, if, if you're listening, you, you got to go check out some pictures of Larry Sparks. He definitely had the greatest sideburns in the history of music. Claim to fame right haircuts. there. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. He's got some great haircuts. It's just great. The 70s suits and stuff. Some really fun uh, pictures of him uh, on, their, on their record covers and stuff. But um, he replaced Carter Stanley and the Stanley Brothers, right, Stash? Yeah, that's right. So Carter Stanley died, and then Larry Sparks came in to do some lead singing. Big shoes to fill. Yeah. 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 So we're going to hear a song, um, Green Pastures in the Sky, with Ralph Stanley and the Clinch Mountain Boys. Uh, it's a live uh, performance and uh, with featuring Larry Parks uh, on lead vocals, too, Stash. Yes. Yeah, singing and, and playing guitar. <laughs> 